Hey, what up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It's episode number 475, and it is May 6th, one day after Cinco de Mayo, or as I would say, the 27th anniversary of my second DUI. Here we are, a celebration today. We're all alive. We're buckled in with our headphones or however else you listen to this show. I welcome you here, and I thank you for stopping by every week. Great guest today. Great guest. I, uh, I don't think a lot of people understand how much great music was going on in the 80s. You had all kinds of different styles. You had new wave. You had punk rock. You had metal. You also had that big, big urban cowboy country push going on. Do you guys remember Urban Cowboy? Have you ever seen that masterpiece with Mr. John Travolta? Riding the mechanical bull down at Gillies. Anybody remember Gillies? Anybody remember Gillies? Eating the worm out of the tequila, all that shit. White trash fighting in a pickup truck, living in a mobile home park. What a film. It's amazing that John Travolta did two movies that changed how a lot of people dressed and looked. Saturday Night Fever being all disco. And then a few years later, full-blown country. There was guys in my high school wearing cowboy hats in the 10th grade or whatever that was, just walking around with a can of skull. Got a can, you, you got a dip with that white, that white circle around the back pocket. You got a chew. Dude, let me get a, let me get a, let me get a sniff. Let me get a, a dip. <laughs> I love life when it was so simple like that. No internet or anything. You just saw a movie and your, your day was changed. The next day, you were down at the fucking Kmart picking up some Wranglers and some uh, Lucchese cowboy boots, maybe some gators or snake. It was funny because you went from your country outfit right into your Guns N' Roses outfit because the cowboy boots were universal, universal. It was hilarious to think that the cowboy boot was part of the rock and roll look. I love it all. I love it all. I'll take it all. It's all great to me. And uh, especially that new wave scene. A lot of people don't talk about that much. Underrated. That whole new wave world is underrated. And in 83, it was exploding. And you know I love the S Festival. Well, day one was the New Wave Day. You had In Excess, Divinals, uh, Stray Cats. Who else did you have? The Clash, of course, headline. But you also had my guest today, Mr. Mike Score from A Flock of Seagulls, which is very underrated band. First two records, absolutely smoking. Just a great, dark kind of synth rock flavor. All that new wave had some uh, great synth in it. Of course, Gary Newman being one of my all-time favorites. But you cannot deny how great A Flock of Seagulls were. And it's funny because when I put up that Mike was going to be on the podcast, people were like, whoa, unusual guest. And I thought, wow, what a score. What a great guest to talk to somebody that was that big back then. Imagine touring with the police on the Synchronicity Tour. You know how big the police were on the Synchronicity Tour? They were doing football stadiums. New Wave was everywhere, and MTV was just pumping the shit out of it, and I'm glad they did. I'm glad I got to... uh, Got to uh, enjoy all kinds of different music back then and not just be boxed into like metal only, dude. Uh, It is who I am today because of all the different music and uh, where I grew up. So thank God for that. You're going to love this episode. And when I am done with it, please check out the first two records and also check out Mike's solo record. All his stuff is great. And this guy was very, very cool. And what a great guest. You remember, of course, Flock of Seagulls from Iran and uh, Wishing, which is an amazing song. Space Age Love Song. 
Uh, many, 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 many great songs. The deep tracks are uh, what I really love. Nightmare, uh, all kinds of stuff. So uh, thank you, Mike, for doing the show. What a fucking great guest. Um, okay, also, I am just uh, home from Vegas. I will be in San Francisco tomorrow, opening for the Rival Sons at the Fillmore. Come on out. This is a last-minute booking. I can't wait to pop up there and do a little comedy in between Sheepdogs and Rival Sons. This is an incredible bill. Those two bands are some of my favorites and some of my favorite people, and I've had them on the podcast, both bands, many times, and I absolutely love their music. This new uh, Rival Sons record has been nonstop on my stereo, nonstop, Feral Roots. So that's going to be great. I want to give everybody a shout out that's brand new to the Patreon, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey to support and get all these bonus episodes. We're up to 32 now. Jeffrey Hatch, candles are lit for you, my friend. Norm B, Todd Lightly, Brian Hoffman, and Aaron McCoy. All serious Dell Razors. Thank you, my friends, for uh, doing that. I got something for the Dell Razors, too. You want something free? I got it right here. How you doing with your taxes? If you're drowning in IRS tax debt, please get ready to take down this number to take advantage of the new IRS tax forgiveness programs that may help you free yourself of IRS collection agencies. Man, that stuff's a nightmare, right? The IRS has recently hired private debt collection agencies to start collecting your outstanding taxes. They can already garnish your wages, put liens on your property, and levy your bank account. If you are drowning in IRS tax debt, the people of Civic Tax Relief can help protect you from the IRS collection agencies. Stop the added fees and wage garnishments and finally break free from the IRS. Call Civic Tax Relief right now. It is free for the Dell Razors. Free information. Find out about the Fresh Start program. Civic Tax Relief Special Tax Hotline can help you discover all the relief programs. Here it is right here. 800-541-1189. You qualify for a free consultation. 800-541-1189. Don't wait. Don't dodge the calls. I know how annoying it is. You look at your phone and you're like, oh, no, who's this? Don't dodge calls anymore. Get some help from the great civic tax relief. 800-541-1189. 800-541-1189. Helping all the Dell racers out there. God, tax stuff is a nightmare. Don't sleep on that. Get some help, man. That's all you can do. You're going to feel way better by getting help. You'll be like, oh, man, this was so easy. I should have just done this instead of stressing every night. All right, I love all you guys. Don't forget, uh, next road show will be June 7, 8, 9 at the La Jolla Comedy Store in San Diego. All tickets are on DeanDelRay.com. I love you guys. Let's get down with some uh, Mike Score here, a flock of seagulls. Keep the candles lit. See you guys. All right, here we are, another episode of Let the Be Talk. Well, this is a fantastic guest. Uh, introduce yourself, my man. Yeah, I'm Mike Score from A Flock of Seagulls. Yeah, Flock of Seagulls, dude. I mean, I've been doing this show seven years, and it never amazes me. Uh, like, wow, I'm talking to you. I saw you at the US Festival in 83. I saw that was you a big one. <laughs> yeah, that was a big one, right? Yeah. I saw you a couple times in the 80s, and, but that was uh, really the big smashing. Uh, it was like the crown jewel, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Was yeah. that the biggest show you ever played with Flock of Seagulls? Uh, yeah, it was. I mean, that was like, I think they said there were like four or 500,000 people at the actual show with maybe 200,000 at the stage at yeah. any one time, depending yeah. on the band that was on, you know, but. I mean, look at that lineup. Wall yeah. of Voodoo, Oingo Boingo, The Clash Headline, uh, Stray Cats, yeah, Men that, at Work. That was the... That was the eighth, that, that new wave day. It really, yeah, yeah, yeah. the first day, Saturday yeah, yeah. or uh, Friday, whatever it was. It's, it's crazy when I think back to the early 80s, because I'm 53, 
there was really kind of four giant music scenes going on. You had New Wave, mm -hmm. which was massive. Then you had the hair metal that was cracking open. And then you had punk rock that was like underground but huge, like Black Flag and all right, that. Right, yeah. And then you also had that urban cowboy. That movie comes out, and you've got this full country scene uh, sweeping across America. Yeah, America's big enough to handle all of that stuff. That's yeah. what I think. How many... A 400 million people? That's 100 million a genre, right? <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. you can't do well out of that, you can't do well, you know. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, let's go back to, you. you're from Liverpool. Yeah, basically. Basically. I, I wasn't born in Liverpool, but since I was a little kid, I lived in Liverpool. And what was the, uh, the, the thing that cracked it open for you? Was it the Beatles? You mean that turned me towards it, music? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it was the Beatles, you know, because when I was a little kid, uh, that was on the... The Beatles were on the news. That's how big they were in England. Like, John Lennon got a haircut, you know, and everybody got the same haircut the next day. If they released a single, it was, you know, the new single straight in at number one. So you heard about that all the time. And, of course, because they were great, it never went away. But um, I also liked the Stones and a lot of the other like 60s kind of acts, so stuff like the zombies and all that, you know, which we're doing. Strange enough, I didn't know it at the time, but I think they were their new wave of the time. Yeah. There was like the big 60s bands, the Stones and the Beatles, and then there were these other bands on the edge doing slightly more atmospheric stuff, and uh, that's what really caught me. You know, it's kind of like, oh, I think I could get into that. So when I was about 13... Me and my friend Andy, we, you know, we bought a guitar between us and a mic between us and a little, like, 5-watt amp, and we started messing about, you know. It's like, oh, you play guitar on this. We never knew how to tune it up or anything. We didn't know. How. But we would play along with a record and have the guitar and the vocal coming through the guitar amp. And, you know, and that was so much fun that uh, when he went off to live somewhere else, I kind of always had it in the back of my mind to do it properly. So when I was, I don't know, probably about 19, I really, well, basically what happened was I went past a music store and I saw a bass guitar in the window and I just went, I got to have that. Yeah, I went and the bass it. is sexy, right? <laughs> yeah, I just, I just looked at it and I went, I've got to have that guitar. And that's where it all triggered off in me, you know. And then I played bass for a couple of years and then synths came out. And that's really, I suddenly went, wow, that's much more uh, ethereal and stuff than a bass. You know, so I bought a synth. Well, an um, early synth, like a Moog? What yeah. was around then? What companies? Um, I bought a Korg MS-10. It was the cheapest one. In fact, what happens, I went to a place called Frank Hesse's, which was where the Beatles bought all their gear from. And a synth had come in, and I was toying around on it. And the owner came up and he goes, do you know what to do with that? And I went, nope. He goes, well, of all the people that have messed with it, it sounds better with you. He goes, why don't you take it for a couple of weeks and show, you know, work it out and then come back and show us. So I did that and uh, I came back in and then they gave it to me at like a stupid price because they're like, we're not going to be able to sell this. Wow. So I got it at like a third of the price yeah. and that became you know what i did all the bass lines on and stuff and the seagulls were you were you into um like early craft work and that kind of stuff what was good what was your early keyboard uh influence early Probably, bowie that stuff yeah a little bit but uh ultravox oh oh yeah you know with john fox yep. all that stuff uh it was a bit more metallic than than uh like bowie stuff was very melodic and Craftwork was very angular. Yep. Ultravox uh, were somewhere in that. They had melody, but they also had great sound and guitar, you know, and, and they were kind of more on the rock edge than a lot of the synth bands that were going around. So that kind of took me. Um, and then, the, you know, there were lots of bands using bits of synth. I think, I think Depeche Mode, the first... Right. You know, and it was pop songs, which I kind of understood, you know, rather than the um, 
heavy metalish or Pink Floydish. Right, right. I, I could never wrap my head at that time around writing a, like an eight minute song. I was into thirty seconds. Yeah, and that would some be, pop stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like thirty seconds, I can repeat that four times, and then I got into like just uh, listening to TV, and actually TV gave me lines to sing along. I'd go, "Well, that was a cool line. It just fitted with what I was playing," you know. So I ended up writing little bits of songs. It, it's it's amazing when you uh, look at that era of like say mid seventies when you get into like the Cure, mm -hmm. Joy Division, that kind of stuff, and and then right up into uh, Flock of Seagulls because Flock of Seagulls, uh, of course, you're in that early MTV era and everything, right, but yeah. the records were really the first two are just incredible. They're dark. They've got a lot of great vibe. The songs are amazing, and and it really carried on from I think The Cure and Joy Division and and all that more than like I say a B52s that was going on that was right. kind of fun and goofy. Your stuff definitely had a um, a darker vibe. But I think since it's MTV, everything's kind of thrown in as like, oh, yeah, the MTV guys, yeah. right? Yeah, we, well, like I say, you know, we, me and the other guys, we got into being a bit more atmospheric, which I think gave it a darker edge. It wasn't just pop. We wanted to make it more interesting. Um, and, of course, we were starting to understand stuff like Pink Floyd and, and uh, all that by then. And... and uh, um, you know, songs like My Spine as a bass line and all that kind of thing was, was start to influence us. So we kind of knew that if you went a bit darker, it would be more atmospheric instead of being, say, like, well, for me, like AHA, yeah. which is very up and bright, you know what I mean? Of course. So we, and we never really thought that we would make it as a band, so it didn't matter. We, yeah. could, we could be as dark and poppy at the same time as we wanted to, you know? Yeah. We could write any lyrics because it was just us in a rehearsal room. And sometimes we did things that made us fall about laughing. And and other times we were like, wow, man, that was really great. You know, and where did that come from? You know, oh, I don't know. I made a mistake. <laughs> and it yeah. just suddenly went that way. So because we didn't at that time think that we were going to get signed or anything, um, it didn't matter what we did. And then... When we put that jigsaw together, people started listening to us and going, wow, you guys have got like a whole slant of your own going on, you know, which for us was like, wow, we did it somehow, you know? Yeah, yeah. Were you guys early on? Were you out just playing bars or what were you doing? No, no, we basically, we rehearsed every night for probably a year. I mean, eight hours a night because it was our fun. We were in Liverpool, which was a pretty depressed city at that time there was nothing else to do you know england had i think three tv channels yeah you know so yeah. and you know if you if you spent a bit of money on a guitar or something like that you wanted to use it all the time in america you know it tends to be like you'll go and buy 20 guitars and maybe you'll mess with your friends and band on a friday night or something and yeah you'll go out you know yeah, you, collector you, you, guys yeah, yeah you'll go out in your corvette with your mates and to go to a bar but in england you know there wasn't that much money around especially in the north so when we got some gear it's like wow we got to learn to use this really good and and because uh, the weather was bad at the time you know it was it was i think it was midwinter when we started all this we just wanted to be locked in a room yeah know, where it was warm and we would make yeah. as much noise and be as loud as we And have could. something to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, rather than watch the Queen on BBC or something. When you're putting <laughs> together the band, uh, were you auditioning guys? It's like you and your brother, and are you just auditioning guys, or are you just, that just comes together real fast? Um, it started off, I was in a band called Ton Tricks, and they got signed, and they decided to change their bass player, right? So, because I was playing bass with them. But they got signed, and the record company guy that signed them, he said, I love the way you play the bass. He said, but I don't think it fits with this band. He said, it's too aggressive. He said, go start your own band and uh, write a few songs and stuff like that and come back and see me. So I went, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, That's pretty good. You're fired, <laughs> but uh, do your own thing, and yeah. I, which is even better. And then I told my brother, and he said, oh, well, if you're going to start your own brand, uh, band, I'll be the drummer. And he'd never drummed in his life. Yeah. So yeah. we built him a kit out of cardboard boxes. No shit. He bought a set of drumsticks. And we just, 
you know, we just plonked around like this. And I got the synth by then. And then uh, Frank, who was the original bass player, he worked for me in my hairdressing salon. And uh, because I was now getting into the synth, he goes, well, I'll play the bass then. So we had the three of us, and we went into the room upstairs from the hairdresser, and we just messed about for, you know, it didn't seem very long, but it was probably three months, four months. And then we had a couple of guys go, ah, oh, yeah, I'll come play some guitar, you know. Yeah. Because we were like, yeah, it could be great to have a guitarist and a singer. So we started looking, and eventually uh, Paul came along, and, you know, and he played some simple stuff on the guitar, but it fitted because there was room for it. He wasn't trying to overdo it, which a lot of them, oh, yeah. there's a gap, I'll throw 5,000 notes in. Right, Paul, yeah. Paul would just go ding, ding, and you'd go, oh, that was great. It was really thematic, perfect yeah. for the songs. Yeah. Um, and from that, then, you know, we had the structure of a lot of songs like I Ran and Space Age and stuff. And it was just a case of like, okay, let's work out what Paul's going to play on these. And the great thing with Paul was, although the way I see it was he didn't particularly come up with any great ideas. But if you gave him an idea within 10 minutes, that idea would be 10 times better than you thought of. Because he'd take your idea and just expand it, you know, and go, oh, if that's what you want. I can do this and I can do that. I can yeah. go here and I can go there. So with a lot of discussion and like, like we'd say be rehearsing Space Age and we'd play it 30 times one after the other until it just felt right for that. You know, and then the next night we'd come in and play it again and go, still not right, let's keep going. Wow. So I guess where most bands might do something 10 times and go, okay, that's it. We didn't, we just kept going until we thought it was perfect. And then we'd put it up on our board, chalkboard, you know. Yeah, yeah. You, now, you were a hairdresser. Did you go to school for hairdressing? And yeah. then you went to school yeah. and you had your own shop? Yeah. And what kind of uh, haircuts were you doing? Were you cutting, like, uh, rock and roll, mod haircuts and stuff? Or were you cutting anybody? We, we were a punk hairdressers. Oh, that's amazing. So we, it was called uh, Oz the Magic Hairdressers. Yeah. And... Um, we it all started out where we just basically did normal cuts to start with but then when the, the punk thing started sex pistols yeah that you know the punk thing started and we start to get a lot of kids coming in at like five at night and they'd go i'm going out tonight can you do my hair green and then we go yeah and then they'd come in the next morning and go can you get this green out of my hair i gotta go to work <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up you know with a couple of days doing that towards the weekend and then eventually the whole week and then we'd, we'd have like friday afternoon where we do like the, the old ladies and you know yeah because yeah the, the money yeah that well the, the, actually some mums would bring their kids in to get their hair done and then go oh can you do my hair too so we ended up doing like okay this is that special time for them but most of the time it's color or it's perm it's it's yeah, you know Ziggy's uh, yeah. hairdos and stuff like that. And Ziggy, I mean, once he hits, that's yeah. everybody's like, "Whoa!" You can just, I mean, hairdos were such a big part of music back then uh, because it really let you know that oh, this guy isn't a square. He doesn't have yeah, a day yeah. job. That just by a, a jacket and a hairdo. Yeah, it, unless you went the other way and became like talking heads. Right. You know where it was so square. Yeah. That it was it was fashionable. You had to be at one end of the spectrum or the other. Yeah, which you know? is also kind of a, a Bowie era, like Thin White Duke, yeah, th when yeah. you get into the suits. And uh, and also, even some of the uh, clash when they switch over from the first era to then they get into kind of uh, that kind of rockabilly look. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Were you seeing the clash and Sex Pistols and the punk um, rock stuff going on? I like the Sex Pistols. Um, just because of the way they came about. Yeah. You know, in England, you saw it all coming about and the way it was done. I wasn't really into The Clash because I thought they were too political. And I'm not really into bands using their influence politically. You know, to me, a band and music is entertainment. It's not a way of controlling people or putting a seed in their minds. Yeah. You know, to uh, vote Labour because we, you like us. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah. That's yeah. a wrong way to do it. I like it music to me was always like put the headphones on close your eyes and off 
an escape from that yeah. stuff. Right, yeah. I think there's room for both. Um, but I do, uh, I mean, Clash is one of my favorite, but I do also love a great song. Yeah. Uh, if you're just going to get into, like, let's look at the day you played the Us Festival, Stray Cats, Rock This Town. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that's just blowing the roof off the place. Yeah, uh, and I met the Stray Cats a few times, you know, and we had, we had a laugh with them a couple of times. Yeah. But they're on a different pathway to us, you know. And, Absolutely. Uh, uh, it's kind of funny you meet other bands and in those days, of course, every band was your enemy. Yeah. But these days, it's, it's all like, we've all been there, we've all done it, so we can be friends now, you know? Back then, it was pretty com competitive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> fuck those guys, let's blow them off it's the like, stage. fuck those guys, we've got a Grammy, so... Yeah. Have you got one? No, well, yeah. I don't want to talk to you then. That's hilarious. <laughs> It, it's it's funny you're a hairdresser of course you're known for the the radical haircut uh on the videos and everything that was uh so signature with you it was pretty pretty yeah. a radical look and right away like oh we know who you are well you know when we got towards that um i could call it like era of a flock of seagulls we knew you had to look like what you sounded you had to be individual. Yeah. You had to be Bowie Mark II. You know, yep. Ziggy Mark II. Gary Newman. If all that stuff, they all had super strong images. You know? Totally. And that's what we wanted. So the way we dressed moved us in that. And once the hairdo happened, it put us right in there with them. You know, along, because people would say, well, yeah, Bowie's got a Ziggy, but look at this guy. You know, he's yeah. got this big thing on his head and... You know, and and to me, I look back at that now and I go, hey, what a work of genius. And I laugh, laugh yeah. my head off, you know. I love it. I mean, yeah. I knew who you were a mile away. When you, yeah. here we are at 200,000 people at the S Festival, and there, <laughs> there the you guy. are. That's the guy. <laughs> yeah. That is the guy. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's pretty wild. Yeah. When you when you start writing songs, were you, were you uh, getting into Devo at all? Because uh, that was really big in that time. I did like Devo, you know. Um, uh, Frank was more into Devo, and he had kind of introduced me. Again, uh, to me, it was a little bit angular. Yeah. But I liked, uh, I liked, um, I can't get, no. Da -da -da, right. Because I knew that song from the Stones. So right. I, I'm like, what a great take on it, you know. Um, but uh, my, my songwriting was, uh, I think it's kind of influenced by the 60s a bit more than that. I like listening to that, but I would never try and do anything like that. Yeah, yeah. So. When you're sitting down, were, did lyrics come pretty easy for you, or was that the tough part, or the music? Which, or did it just come at the same time? Uh, a good song will write itself. Absolutely. Once, once you roll the ball down the hill, it just keeps going, you know. Um, this, like Space Age, I wrote in 20 minutes. Wow. You know, I think I, I got the first verse, um, thought about how to extend it, and then... I went, oh, I don't really need to. I don't need any more lyrics just to keep it as simple as possible. And then all of a sudden it was done. And I, I remember going, it needs a middle eight. No, it doesn't need a middle eight. The song told me, we don't need a middle eight. We've got a great atmosphere. We've got a great guitar line. We've got simple lyrics. Just leave me alone. Yeah. So that's how it stayed. When I wrote Wishing, uh, I'd had that riff for a year. And then one day I just sat down and played it. And the whole song just float in so you know like i say a good song will write itself other songs you get a verse a chorus and then for some reason you just kind of go i can't be asked to work on this it'll come back if it's any good it'll come back and finish itself and uh it's still like that you know, yeah it's still yeah songs the same way when you do the first record that was a collection of some an EP and then uh, some other tracks, right? Because you kind of got an EP out. And then what, Jive comes into the scene? Yeah, we were working with Bill Nelson. Yeah. Uh, and basically, I think we had a three-single deal with Bill's record label. And then uh, Jive came along. and they Is that Clive Davis? Yeah, uh, it was guy called clive calder oh got you yeah he he owned zomba publishing and stuff like that just started zomba records so they came along and they went uh we're gonna make an album and we're like uh okay we, <laughs> we've not really been in studios or anything so um 
they said, you know, we don't need it till next year. They didn't really understand what New Wave or any of that was about. They just saw us and went, well, this band's got something that's not ripe yet, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Did they see you at a gig or did they come to your rehearsal? Yeah, we did a, we did a gig in, in London. And uh, we'd actually been in rehearsal in London for about a week. And about 12 record companies had been to see us. Is that right? And they all said no. Then Virgin came along and they said... Um, we'll pay you this much money just not to sign with anyone else. And it's like, so... Like a holding make, deal. Yeah, so we're going to make an album? No, we're going to sign you, we're going to give you some money, and then we're going to wait and see what happens with your kind of music. Oh. So we turned that one down, and then EMI wanted to sign us, and we went to have a meeting with them, and the guy from EMI came back late from his dinner, like an hour late, and we're just sitting there waiting. And I said to my manager, I'm not even going to talk to him. I said, the guy is obviously not interested. Yeah. Uh, and that was at a time I find out later when record companies would sign 20 bands a week and hope that one of them had a hit single. And then the rest, they just drop. Oh, that's insane, so, right? It's just yeah. throw it and see what sticks. Yeah. Um, so we ended up meeting this guy from Jive at a gig um, and... We went to talk to him, and he was great. He basically said, I'm not going to give you any money. We're going to sign you. We're going to make an album, and we're going to spend all this money on promoting you. He said, we'll make you famous, and then you'll make some money. And to us, that was like, this guy's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the last thing we needed was a record company to give us a million quid. Yeah. That we'd just go and blow. Yeah. And then yeah. we'd owe them a million quid. You know? Yeah, yeah. And he was he had the right idea and, and he'd worked with A C D C and Def Leppard and Mutt Lang was uh involved with them as a producer. Um they was a, a huge, genius. Yeah, they had a huge publishing empire. So once we talked to him a couple of times, it was like, We're going here. We'll be broke for a bit, but if they promote everything properly, then success will come. And it was perfect, you know, it worked out perfectly. Now, when you go into the studio, how fast do you record the second half of it to make the complete record? Um, it took us probably um, three or four months. Yeah. Because we couldn't work all the time because they were still building the studio. Oh, that's so they, amazing. They were the first studio in England to have an SSL desk. Oh, wow. So it got put in and then the engineer goes, well, we have to take a week off to learn how to work this thing. Yeah. And those you know, things, those SSLs back then, they looked like a giant spaceship. Exactly, You're like, yeah. what? Yeah. You so, know, you know we, compared we, to a Neve, when you look at a Neve and then you look at that, you go, Whoa, yeah. this is a straight seventies here. Yeah. You know, so he had to learn. So we'd be doing some drums and it'd be like, Oh, they're going to put the SSL in, uh, come back next week, right in the middle of a drum session or something, you know, <laughs> and then it would be, okay, now we got a, uh, work for two days again to get the drum sound while we f make sure the SSLs were in. Yeah. But it, it got done, you know, and uh, Mike Shipley, who engineered it, was brilliant. Um, Mike Howlett, who was our producer, he was brilliant. He, he, he took what we were thinking, which was we didn't know how to explain, but he knew how to get it from our heads to the engineer's head, if you know what I mean. It's like, no, they want this kind of sound. Yeah. Uh, Mike Shipley had been used to working with ACDC and real heavy stuff, and suddenly for him it was like, no, we're working with synths now, and you know, completely different yeah, landscape. Yeah, I mean, when you're laying that kind of stuff down, especially drums, because when I listen to your records, I always thought maybe they were early programmed drums or those uh, those Simmons yeah. electronic drums or something. But were they actually acoustic drums? Um, some of it, uh, yeah, and some of it was Simmons, you know. But um, none of that stuff had been really used in recording before that. So they had to kind of slightly develop what they were doing to make all that work with the other sounds, you know. Um, I didn't know much about studios at all. I just sat there and was like, wow. Yeah. Look at all them lights. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how long have you had Flock of Seagulls been a band now that you're in the studio? Let's, uh, like Maybe uh, a year and a half. That's amazing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when you really kind of look at it, I think with music, 
it almost seems like if you don't get the deal in the first two years, it's probably not going to happen. Isn't that interesting? It, it is, but there, there's also bands that say we're together 10 years. Yeah. And then suddenly they get huge. You yep. know, they get a deal and get huge. And it's like, how come? You know, you were playing these songs 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's, it's just like time catches up with them or, and it's suddenly right, you know. I mean, uh, a totally different style of music. But when you watch that documentary, A Twisted Sister, here's a band that just played covers and was trying to get a record deal for like, 10 years mm -hmm. selling out massive rooms and no one wanted them and right. then one guy finally signs them and boom yeah so you just never really know it just depends on who you have in the band and if they're willing to take the ride and if they play music to play music yeah, uh, yeah you, you find gotta, out you've got to do it for yourself absolutely you know i mean i, I think what zz top like huge in texas or exactly something. nowhere else nowhere else they changed their style a little bit and went worldwide, right? That's so true. I mean, they were just kind of the, the biggest band from Texas. You yeah. Know? I mean, they were open for the Stones and stuff uh, all through Texas, but they weren't big anywhere else. Yeah. And then, look, they do the Eliminator record and all that in the 80s, yeah. and it completely takes off. Right. And we just watched the other day a, a documentary about Bowie. Oh, yeah. And how terrible he was for, how long was it, like 10 or 12 years? And then, you know, I mean, he had a hit with Space Oddity and yeah. all that in the middle of all that. But he kept going and all of a sudden turned into David Bowie. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that it just depends what you're doing it for. If yeah. you're doing it for yourself, like you said, it doesn't matter. Eventually, you realize, well, 20, 30 years gone by and I've been doing art the whole time. So yeah. this is all that really matters. Yeah. Um, you can call it art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like to, I like to be naive, but being in the biz, I'm, you know what happens. Yeah. You just, it's, it's a, it's a very brutal business, yeah. and it's, uh, it, it, you are lucky enough to have these hit songs to where you can still play in this day and age, and people, it touches them. Somebody asked me yesterday, why do you think the '80s? have such a big impact on people still. And I say it was the last era before computers took over brains. Right. So people were out. They were, they were uh, living their lives. They were doing things. They were experimenting. And it was you, the band, and the audience. And that really touched people. They remember, like, whoa, that yeah. song. I was at the Us Festival. I got sunburned. They had no bathroom. And yeah. it's just a full visual memory. But now with the computers, it's like, oh, I saw them on YouTube. Yeah, you know, so there's no <laughs> yeah. real passion. Connection, or, connection yeah. right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, well, and in those days, if you liked music, you bought it. So you it meant it. something to you. Yeah. So these days they just go and go, oh, I'll, I'll just steal that off the band on an MP3 and I'll listen to it this afternoon and forget it because there's another one tomorrow. Yeah. You yeah. Know? They have nothing invested in it. Exactly. Yeah. Which is really insane. Um, yeah, I remember buying an album, you know, oh. and I would, uh, I'm talking a 12 inch, you know, uh, vinyl. Vinyl. And you'd be looking at the cover while it was on, and you'd be hoping there were pictures and lyrics, and, and you know. And as it spun around, you'd be going, "What's this next song called?" And you'd be stopping it, and putting that back on again. Yeah. That was like, that was like you immersed yourself in it, you know. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't happen like that anymore. No. And also, when you bought a record back then, if it had only one good song, you were like, "Oh." Yeah. Oh no, my money, because you didn't have money. So you're yeah. like, seven dollars I spent on this, and ah, yeah. oh, I only like one. I'm not going to listen to that. Would actually uh, gut me, right. like to a feeling of like, ah, oh, I knew it was just in the collection, and I was never going to listen to right. it, you yeah. know. And it, now they just buy the song they like. That's it. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a different world. So when these th days, it's easier to release music. Yeah. But it's harder to find good music. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're like, there's a, it's a great platform of like maybe being uh, found without the machine using YouTube and, and, yeah. and social media and everything, but it's also a free medium. I really don't know how bands are doing it now no that idea. are like I got a ton of bands. I interview bands on here all the time and I love them. They're new bands and they're killing. But I'm like, wow, like where. 
Where's your niche? Where do you make your living? How do you survive? Yeah. It's it's wild. Now, did you sign one of those crazy record deals that was bad, or was it good? Um, ours was, I think it was fairly good. Yeah. Did you have the publishing, or did they? Um, the publishing, as far as I, I know now, it's way in our favor. Yeah, yeah. Um, 30 it's, year, it's a 30-year mark or whatever? Yeah, I think it was yeah, like 28 years or something, yeah. or something crazy. It was like 25 plus an option, right. stuff like that. But it... it it kept going, you know. It's it's amazing that although there isn't the machine anymore, my royalty checks tell me there is a machine somewhere. Is that right? <laughs> giving them out like this. You know? You're still getting money. Yeah. So you know, it's really good because it it gets in movies and yeah. stuff like that. That's you know? where the money still is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's always been a I think for us a fair deal. I think Jive and Zomba who did the publishing were. Yeah, you know they were happy that we made it and and looked after us. Were you the sole songwriter? Um, basically, the songwriting in our band was. I would either write the whole song or have the idea for the song. Like I say, I'd have a, a verse and a chorus, and then, I would take it to rehearsal and go. I got this idea, and then we just beat the hell out of that idea until it turned into a song. Oh. You know, um, but certain songs like Wishing and Space Age and. The more you live, you know, I wrote them Yeah, first note to last note. When I ran uh, Hits and Explodes and, let's say, Us Festival uh, after that and stuff, what kind of tours were you doing after that? Were you out headlining? Were you on packages and stuff like that? Who um, were you out with? The, f the first big tour we did was, I think it was the Psychedelic Furs. We opened up for them. Who were you know doing really well at the time? Not, they were like big college yeah. stuff, and then it was I think the Go Go's. Oh, were, they were huge. Yeah, they were like in we the got top. the beat era. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, then after that, it was the Police. The Police. We toured basically <sighs> synchronicity tour. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, we were playing 50, 60, 70 thousand people a night. You know, through America. Uh, and into Europe. Yeah. And then uh, the fix took over. Once we, we had a problem with Paul, the guitar player. Uh huh. And once, uh, once that happened, the fix, we were hoping Paul would be able to sort himself out and come back, but the fix got on that tour. They became huge from that tour. What was the problem with Paul? Drugs uh, or, or yeah, attitude? You know, rock and roll problems. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, we don't like to say anything bad about it yeah we gave him plenty of room and plenty of uh help to straighten himself out but it's uh he was on the edge of a cliff all the time yeah and he just kept falling off it's amazing to look at uh what police were doing on that tour yeah. you look at a band that had you know don't stand so close to me and roxanne and then you get to synchronicity and they're doing actual football stadiums yeah, in oakland they did the day in the green and when you're out on that tour, are you just blown away that a band is that big? I mean, there was other bands, too. Bowie was huge mm -hmm. during the Last Dance. That's 83. Yeah. All that era is massive. It was, um, well, you know, for, for us, it was, okay, we, you know, we started in clubs and colleges, and then the, then the clubs got bigger, and then it moved into, like, 5,000 theaters. Then we did a few shows with the Cars, which were, I think like 30, 40,000. Then we did the odd show here and there that was a stadium. Like, um, I think we played up in Toronto with, uh, I think Joan Jett was on it when she was huge. Yeah. Like, talking heads. And we did that. Um, even though we were way down the bill, there were still 80,000 people. Oh, there, people right? came early. They, yeah. they weren't trickling in. Because all the bands back then, if you look at that Us Festival, I was just looking at it. Let's look at the uh, lineup real quick. The Every band, massive hits. Uh, even Divinals was the first yeah, band yeah. that day. But In Excess, those were two kind of new bands. But Wall of Voodoo had uh, radio, Mexican radio. radio. Oingo Boingo was killing it all over MTV. Flock of Seagulls. English Beat, Stray Cats, Men at Work, The Clash. They right. all had all hits. Big hit stuff, so yeah. it wasn't like a big band and then an unknown band. It was... Uh, yeah, it was so well put together. <laughs> that uh, it, package, yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it was just incredible. But 
even uh, across America, like you're saying, they would have these kind of uh, packages yeah. that would just be like you wanted to see everyone. Yeah, we played in Philadelphia with Genesis as well. You know, oh amazing, hundred thousand people. Oh, so, but to us, you know, it was a, it was a gradual step up. It was probably faster than a lot of bands because we did it. You know, we went from clubs to stadiums in I don't know, six or eight months. You know, um, but that's because we had great agents. No, oh, yeah, stuff like that, and yeah, and MTV is really playing the shit out of you. Yeah, and because we were MTV, you know, favorite boys kind of thing at the time, everybody wanted us, so we got on everything that was good, um, which is, you know, people used to say to me, "How do you feel?" And I'm like, "I don't have any feelings about it at all. <laughs> it's just going." It was a you whirlwind, know? right? Yeah. You're on a train and it's not stopping at any station. It's just yeah. going and going and getting faster and faster, you know. And uh, there was we had this saying, "Don't look down," because you're going so high, you know. It's gonna, right. It's going to hell of a fall if you come down off that. And uh, it's hard to say when it stopped because I don't remember it stopping. I just right. In between the first record and then when you go do Listen, which is an amazing record. I think the second record is almost better than the first record. It's just definitely like nightmares and stuff. That, yeah, yeah. That, that record, it's definitely got a dark vibe. Are you, you're doing Iran tour. You've got that huge hit and everything's going. How fast do you go home and do this second record? Or are you just touring and doing it in between tours and stuff? Um, no, really... There was a few on Listen that were didn't make it to the first album, maybe four. And then, you know, I used to, on tour, I had a little porter studio, and I never slept well. So I'd be up watching movies, and I'd have a guitar and a little Casio keyboard. And I'd just be playing all night to myself, you know, just like... Duh, duh. And then I'd... Like Nightmares, i watch Mommy Dearest. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, I came up with the, the whole thing and then I went and put on my Porter studio and forgot about it. And then it's like, oh, now you've got to make a new album. I'm like, oh, my, where's my Porter studio tapes? Played Nightmares and we started to rehearse it. And I, like I said, it just kind of wrote itself. I just put myself back into what I thought after the movie. And, you know, and then it just became nightmarish. Yeah, you know, that's a great song. Yeah, I like that one. So how quick do you do that record? Do you do it in England, the States? Where do you do that one? I think we did it in like a month. Yeah? Yeah. In, in London? From, uh, um, Wishing, which was done on its own out in the Bahamas. We, we were in the middle of a break in a tour. And I remember Clive called up. He goes, we need another single because Christmas was coming up. And he goes, do that song that you played me a couple of months ago. And I went, oh, Wishing. And he goes, yeah, yeah that one. I'd already taken that to the band and they hated it. Oh. So I went into the studio with Mike Howlett, who was the producer, and uh, we recorded it. And when it was recorded, everyone went, wow, that sounds great. Can I play on it? So we made up parts for them on it and it came out. It was a huge hit. That's a smasher tune. Yeah. And you did that in Bahamas? Yeah. In Compass the, Christie, that uh, place? Uh, it, yeah, Compass Point. Yeah, yeah. Compass Point. Wow, yeah, that's where Back in Black was done. Yeah, and uh, Thompson Twins were in there at the same time. Thompson Twins. Yeah. Man, so, that studio's got a track record, boy. Yeah, I believe it's just a wreck now. It's just a, you know, uh, I think it was Chris Blackwell who owned Island Records that owned that studio. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they abandoned it or something, so. Yeah, that, that place has got some history, yeah, boy. Yeah. Oh, man. And it, for us, it was a holiday in the Bahamas. Yeah, I mean, like one tour ended, the next one starts next week. You've got five days, book the studio, go in and do it. You know, I think that's the best, the run and gun, because then you're like, we've got to do this. There's yeah. no time to sit there and investigate if it's any good or not, or change a few things. You yeah, can, you can change things ten times and you end up back where you started. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I I've done records and I went back and listened to them. I've said this before and went, I'm sure there was something on here I hated, but yeah. I don't know where it is now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fine. Somewhere. You know. It's funny that you say the band hated wishing. It's was there as you start to get bigger. Of course, there's going to be some serious uh, turmoil in every band, right? Like, what starts the boiling point over you and your brother or the other guys? Wh what What is the uh, problem with that? Um, me and my brother, we're brothers. 
Yeah, so, I get it. Like the Kinks, like, like my, the Oasis. Yeah, he's my big brother. Yeah. He doesn't like me doing stuff that, you know, that I want to do without him saying it's okay. So that led to arguments all the time. Uh, you know, things like I would write a song and I'd say, I want this beat. And he'd go, I'm the drummer. I'll decide what the beat is. And then I'd go, okay, then we won't do that song. You can fuck off. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I'll do it on a drum machine. Um, uh, Paul was just his, his problems. Yeah. He just couldn't focus. He was more focused on his problems than he was on music. Um, and then, you know, Frank had his own little world, his own little problems. And we kind of agreed at the beginning that we would try and internalize everything so we could sort it out. But it became, uh, how do we, how, how can you help someone who's on drugs when you don't do drugs yourself? Yeah. You don't understand what they're going through, you know, and they start to go outside, you know. So uh, then you have to kind of go, this is ruining the band for me. I've got to cut it, cut it away. Absolutely. You know, so then that guy's gone. And then it's like, well, what are we going to do without him? We have to replace him. Um, uh, I don't know. I haven't got time and I want him back. And it's like, well, no, you know. And to me, a lot of it was like, I'm not letting, after going through all this and working hard and stuff, I'm not letting someone who's on drugs ruin it for me. Right. I'm just going to go on on my own. Especially if you don't do drugs, it's so weird to have a, a, a drug addict in the band mm -hmm. because you're you're like, oh, what the hell is going on here? It's always it's just, and also the, I think the weirdest thing about a band that a lot of people don't talk about, uh, other than your br brother, you're joining this thing of strangers. Yeah, and as you uh, become a band, you start to figure out who people are, and you're like, "Oh, this fucking guy," yeah, or exactly. you know, and yeah. and it could be two, three years down the road, and you add a monster couple of hit songs, yeah. and you're going, "Oh shit!" And then it really electrifies if the band starts to slow down a little bit. Then you're like, everybody's pointing fingers, and it yeah. gets it gets w really weird. And the, there's things like you know when you're you're a band that doesn't have a hit and it doesn't matter you can come into rehearsal with any song and everyone will play it and then you'll decide if it's any good or not yeah now they all have an opinion you bring a song in and they go i'm not going to play that i don't like it yeah you, why not you didn't like space age when i first brought it in either but look at that yeah well you know i know better now that kind of thing, you know. Uh, and so yeah. you end up just going, okay, I'm not going to take any more songs in for them to rehearse. L you write a song, let's see. And, oh, I don't, I don't know. I can't write songs. It's the evil of ego. Ego yeah. is bizarre because instead of sitting back and going, I don't know how to write songs. I can play the shit out of drums, though. We've got a guy here, like let's say a Pete Townsend. You're like, this guy's just churning out tunes. Yeah. I don't know where the hell these are coming from. I'm just going to play yeah. in a band. I'm lucky to be in a band with a guy that can write songs. Look at all the people that can't write songs. Yeah, exactly. There's a million burner guitar players out there. Incredible guitar players. Zero songwriting skills. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, to look at like wishing and not not know like, hey, that's a great song. I know when a great song, a guy comes in, uh, you leave rehearsal, it's in your head. You're like, yeah. that's a great song. Yeah. Well, I, for me, you know, because I'm not a player, like musical player. Yeah. Songwriting is my thing. Same with me. You know, so it, when I bring it in, it's a simple. And sometimes, you know, people want, oh, what do I play then? Yeah. But you think of something. Am I writing then? Not really. <laughs> I'm just playing along with what I did and embellishing it, you know. And, and suddenly that becomes, well, then I'm not going to bother. Yeah. Well, why? Because I'm not getting any publishing, you know, and stuff like that. It just becomes a... It becomes a crazy animal. Yeah. It does. I, uh, when you came in, I was listening to your solo record. I had no idea you had one. And that's one of the things I love about this show is when I am going to interview somebody that I, I, I liked from the past. It's great to go, wow, this, is a, this solo record is great. It came out in 2014. Yeah, something like that. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's just really cool. It's got such a vibe to it. Yeah, I think it's where the Seagulls would have been next. Yeah. You know, and I wanted to make a solo album for a long time, but uh, a couple of things, confidence in a release. Right. And not only just that, but in, in the, uh, the situation that music's in, I didn't know anything about promotion, but... 
I just woke up one morning and went, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go spend the money, go in the studio, do these songs. Uh, if people like them, they like them. If not, I didn't expect to make any money out of it. For me, it was just like, get them off your chest. Yeah. You know, and I really enjoyed doing it. I thought it turned out great. And uh, I was happy with it, you know. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds fantastic. Yeah. It was I great. I didn't shop it around or try and get a deal. Or you anything. just put it out on your own? Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, and then what was that uh, world like? Because you'd never done that before. Was it just something where you recorded it and you, did you make CDs and sell them on a website or did you just put them on iTunes? Yeah, just on iTunes. That was it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I did intend to make a couple of thousand to sell, but it suddenly became now I'm working. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want music to be work, you know. Yeah. It's like, I did the studio, that was great. I got the album. It's on iTunes. I don't want to be lugging CDs around from here to there. And a lot of people went, oh, I want the CD. I was like, well, if it's if it suddenly did 100,000 on iTunes, um, I'll make some CDs. Yeah, yeah. But I just let it sit. And, of course, after about a year, I was gone from it anyway. You know, it, it was... It was out, it was on its own, and I was on to whatever I was doing next. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've been doing the Seagulls on and off pretty much your whole life, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and it's amazing, like we said earlier, how the 80s really, really grabbed people. What is it like... Uh, like in a career of your career now, is it just a lot of corporates and one-offs and all that? Is that what it's all about? Um, well, you know, there's stuff like the Lost 80s tour, which is, you know, a good uh, 20, 25 dates on the run, which is a proper tour. That's great. Um, it's, it's actually, you know, I'm much older now, so it's much more tiring. Yeah. But it's still great fun, you know, and it's, it's great to go out and be able to go out into the crowd and hang out and sign autographs and talk to people people um in the 80s they would have tore me apart <laughs> just yeah. trying you know yeah. you need your hair <laughs> yeah 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 right it's yeah. just like we want your shoes Beatles style like yeah, 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 yeah. grab them yeah but now people seem more relaxed you know and they, they don't attack they just say hey you know well you know uh selfies is the big thing isn't yep it? so they're there for two seconds they take a selfie hi thanks great everything was great and you know and it's cool it's much more relaxed and um they're, the fans are older, obviously, you know. I like it when they bring kids and the kids have got the hairdo. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. plenty of times. That's why. <laughs> uh, you know, because I have this hairdo now. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> and, great. Um, uh, to me, that's like, I have a little giggle because I go, wow, that's something I did, what, 35 years ago? And it's still being talked about. Yeah. Did you just roll that hairdo day in and day out, like airports and everything? Uh, yeah, because once I put it in. Yeah. Oh, it, it was, was like it cement was, glue? Yeah. And what? like I'd wake up in the morning, it'd be just be a mess, but I'd just have to like pat it into shape, spray it again, you know. <laughs> what were you using, Aquanet? Uh, that's a secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, really? It was, <laughs> it was a mixture of so much stuff. No right? shit, yeah. huh? And because it was bleached, I used to mix, you know, bleach up with water and spray it to keep it white yeah uh, aquanet any any hairspray that was around any gel that was around so consequently like once a month i could wash it because <laughs> it would take like an hour to get all that stuff out of it yeah you know? i knew a guy that used elmer's glue yeah i've yeah. seen punks that use yeah uh, uh, evo stick oh it's yeah it's a pull the spikes <laughs> up and then, i would never go that far but yeah right Let's talk about you won a Grammy. That's pretty damn cool. It was for the instrumental DNA. Uh -huh. Did you actually go to the Grammys? Because I don't remember watching it back then. But did you go? No, we we were told that we were going to win the Grammy. And my manager was like, nobody knows who's going to win the Grammy. And of course, we were like, of course they do. Otherwise, nobody would be there to pick them up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... We were in Germany recording the Listen album, and uh, we're like, you know, the Grammys are on, we got to go. And he's like, no, you know, you're not going to win anything. And then when we won it, it was like, I told you so, you know. And the thing is, we think if we'd have gone and said, thank you, America, we'd have sold another two or three million albums. I believe that. You know, and so our manager took a lot of stick for that, you know. Uh, we said, you're going to ruin us. Never mind, be good for us. You're going to ruin us. And uh, that turned into a whole quagmire right there. Yeah. But 
it was great to win a Grammy, except it wasn't for me singing. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's pretty interesting, yeah. right? It's like, you're like, wait a minute. I got, exactly. some, I got some hits here, yeah. some great songs that are still being played right now. But at least you have one. Yeah. Uh, you still got the trophy? Uh, somewhere. I think that's, somewhere. <laughs> that's somewhere, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of stories about the Grammys that we won, but uh, they're kind of a you know personal, private things we did and said, and oh, that's crazy. You you mean at, uh, from the Grammy? Just from having the Grammy. Yeah. You know. Like, what do you mean? I'll tell you one quick one, right? Okay. So, I go down to London to my manager's office, and they said, your Grammy's there. And I went, I don't have a Grammy. I wasn't allowed to go pick it up. So they went, he handed it to me, and I just kicked it across the their office and said, you fucking have it, because I couldn't pick it up. It's not mine. And that started a whole big argument. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Mike. You're like a, you're like an outlaw, right? <laughs> somebody really, somebody yeah. told me sometimes you'll snap at some people, like "fuck you, man," like on Facebook and stuff. I, <laughs> I do that for fun. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I get it, man. The, the older you get, the crazy you get, right? Like, oh man. Yeah, I, I'll get on and read some stuff, and I'll just go, ah, "fuck that." I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get onto them. Yeah. And then after five minutes, I'll just stop writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the only yeah, way I'm to done go. With it now, yeah. yeah, it's the only day where yeah. you can go. You recorded the Listen record in Germany? Yeah, at Connie Plank's studio. And how long that record take to do? It was only about six weeks, I think six or eight weeks. It was one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah. Just being in Germany. Connie Plank, who did early Ultravox and stuff, you know. Yeah, and also all that Bowie. And, yeah. And even later, U2 goes out there for like Octung Baby and stuff. Yeah, and we, you know, meeting Connie Plank, who was like the superstar producer in those days. Oh, yeah, who did he uh, do? Uh, like I say, I think he did early Ultravox. Uh, he did a lot of obscure, interesting uh, stuff. I think he, I think he may have done um, the Commissar and stuff like. Oh that. wow! I'm not positive about right. that, but um, but we liked him. Bill Nelson, who we'd worked with, you know, had worked with him and said, "Oh, he's great." So we get out there, and Connie is like, like a farmer. You know, really? with this huge studio, you know what I mean? Yeah. And he's so funny. And um, there was one day, they call it Oktoberfest, I think. Oh, yeah, 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 and yeah. And every, everybody else went out, and I, I didn't want to go out, and I got up late, and we're at the studio. And I go down to the studio, and Connie's like, oh, Mike. He goes, we're not going out drinking. And I went, nah. He goes, good, let's write a song. And so, you know, we go in the studio, and we came out with a, an instrumental and uh, he loved it. We used some weird machines that he, I just got this, you know, let's do this and mess with it. And at the end of the day, at like midnight, we're like, wow, all this came from nothing, just not going drinking, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then everybody else comes back and they're like, well, yeah, it's great. <laughs> You, you got. It's funny you had some instrumentals. Like, were you an Alan Parsons guy? Alan Parsons Project. Uh, I in the sky and all that. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, I had him on recently, yeah. and you know, his uh, his music at times a little bit of uh, electronica, a little bit of seventies, of course, from Steely right. Dan into you know. It's, it's, it's like a flavor is so original and, right. and same with you guys when you listen to it it's funny that it's labeled new wave but there really is this sound of these bands when you listen to it it's got this incredible vibe that no other music has ever had again yeah yeah i mean there are people that uh latched onto it later like interpol and strokes and stuff that grabbed onto some of that uh, early vibe, but there's, there hasn't been bands that really sound like if you look at that day of yeah. the Us Festival. Well, those kind of bands, I call them sonic. Yeah. Very sonic, you know, very sound. Uh, individual, every band, you knew what it sounded like. Yeah. It had its own sound. These days, they all sound the same. And that's all because of, I guess, presets. Yeah, you're right. Preset amps, preset uh, everything. It's like producers go, oh, let's use drum kit number five because that was a hit on such and such as album yeah. or whatever, a single. So we'll use that and then we'll use this guitar preset, you know, and then it's all about the uh, uh, vocal. Yeah. 
<laughs> so vocals have lost their individuality because they yeah. all want to do the full range and it's like no 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 you know be for instance willie nelson sings like willie nelson yeah uh, you know he doesn't sing like Celine Dion. No. Nope. Whereas a lot of people want to sing like Celine Dion. Well, vocal acrobats make me yeah. crazy, oh, and I blame that all on uh, America's Got Talent, the voice, and all that. Yeah. Because America is convinced you're only a good singer if you're doing these acrobats. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that all started back kind of like the Christina Aguilera era, where yeah. people are like, she's amazing. And it's like, well, I'm not knocking her, but I'm saying, why I wish she'd shut up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, why would everybody want to do that? Yeah, uh, it's, you, you know, it's individuality. You know? Yes, like, I'm as good as her because I can do this. Yeah, who it, cares? But you I know? believe that that's the uh, the audience's fault by going like uh, they don't think something's amazing unless it's a triple backflip. You know, I think it's because of what they get told. Right? Yeah, yeah, they you're get, right. Uh, you get told that, uh, say, Christina Aguilera. And yeah. Celine Dion and Mariah Carey yeah. can hit a, I don't know what, a fucking high C or something. Yeah. Well, wouldn't it sound great if you just missed it a little bit? Yeah. And then yeah. you go, oh, I know that. That's Christine Aguilera. A little grease in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a I think Bon Scott's the greatest singer of all time. Yeah. And uh, that's a lot of attitude, flavor, uh, enunciation, melody. Everything that he had was so, like, wow, man. Yeah, Everybody. like, uh, you know, I don't know if you know uh, Alex Harvey. Oh, like, the best. I yeah. mean, that's where Bond comes from, right. you know. But that sensational Alex Harvey, that music, and uh, I heard that they wanted him to sing for ACDC. I'm not sure on that. But I don't know either, but. The, that stuff, when you hear that, and then you see like Bond, or let's say a Frankie Miller, guys like this, where they take some stuff and, you know, Rod grabbed a little Frankie Miller. And, and they make it their own, yeah. it's incredible. Because then you get something else from influences and not copying. Yeah, yeah, you take you take a trip with them. Yeah. You know, the way they announce and, and stuff like that. We have a saying, don't we, and it's the uh, the perfection of imperfection. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, that's, that's So it's the imperfections that actually make things better. That's so and the, true. And the trouble these days is, Everybody wants to be perfect. Yeah. And, you know, it's the it's the stuff that's not perfect. Well, Pro really Tools can. ruined it, really, because you're just like, I just laid the vocal, I'm going to go have lunch, just fix it. Yeah. And that's just... But uh, that's not Pro Tools' fault, that's the people that are using it. You're right. Pro, you're Pro right. Tools is just a tool, and it's... Yeah. If you haven't got ears that goes, you know, your ears say, I love it when that guitar slides out of tune there, or the vocal, yeah. or the drummer misses a beat. You know, like, for instance, the Beatles... They left mistakes in. Yeah. Because they'd be recording and they'd be on four track and someone would make a mistake and they'd go, well, we have to start the whole song again now. And uh, Or they'd just go, we can just leave it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then people go, that was a mistake, but it sounds awesome. It's always great when you look back at some of the stuff and yeah. then somebody like, let's say David Gilmore goes, oh, well, the guitar was actually broken at the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and we didn't stop. And you're like, oh, that tone, yeah, you yeah. know. Or I... I I knocked my pedal over and it changed the thing right here. It's great. And, and you go, because you know, when you listen to it, you listen as it's supposed to be like that. Yeah. And it also gives it a story. Yeah. It gives it a story. When you, Can you give me anything that you remember from the US Festival? I was there for three days and I was backstage on the second day. And when I think about the insanity of that, but when you first hear you're getting the US Festival... We don't know it's going to be as big as it is. Uh, you get the gig. Are you out on an American tour, or is it a one-off? And do you show up, and you're like, what the hell? Look at this thing. We are, as far as I remember, we, we got told we're going to play the US Festival. It's going to be the biggest festival ever. Yeah. It's on the side of a mountain or something like that, you know? So we are like, okay, yeah, okay. You know, we get there. We get there early in the afternoon. I do like five hours of interviews. So I'm burnt. In the tent? In the tent. Right. I'm already burnt before we go on. I remember looking at the stage and going, how the hell are we going to fill this stage? Yeah, it was huge. It was like yeah, well, you, 40 bands on there. Yeah, you had a couple <laughs> pieces of equipment up yeah. there. Right? I had a synth and a couple of guitar amps, you know, and a, a little drum kit. Um, we did that. 
and then you know it was i remember looking across at frank and he was two inches tall you know what i mean he's like yeah. that's how far away he was and i couldn't hear anything except the snare drum that's it yeah no vocal uh, I mean, I can hear myself. Right, but, but no guitar guys, or anything. Gotcha. Just, just the snare drum, and I just went. I'm just gonna have to go on that. Like it's like singing yourself with a metronome and your keyboard, you know. Um, of course, it it did get better as the set went on. But when we first went on, it was just like, are we even here? Yeah. <laughs> and then you look out, and you, I tend to not really look out at a crowd. I'll look at the, you know. The first 10 rows. Yeah. And then I remember looking up and going, there is nothing but people. Nothing but people. As far as the eye can see. Oh, man. You know, and that was uh, that was the wow moment, really, because I'm suddenly like, oh, God, I hope we're good. You know, yeah. hope we're good today. Um, and then after the, ne the next day after that, it was our tour started in New York. Oh, so, so you so left all the way back to the other side? Yeah. We, so we flew from England into L.A. to do that and then straight back to New York. So it, it was just more or less like, uh, did the US Festival really happen? Yeah, that's it pretty was just wild. Just like bang, bang, you know, yeah. in and out. And then you're just on a full blown locomotive hit song tour. Yeah, yeah. That's wild. Through, I think, like, I don't know about, uh, that was like three or four months long, that tour. I think, was that with The Fix? Maybe. Maybe The Fix later on joined us on that one. Yeah. It, it, it really starts to get a blur and you don't remember. Yeah, yeah. You know, the I timeline just falls apart. Where are you living these days? You're in the States? We live in Florida and in Liverpool still. Oh, wow. Two spots. Yeah. Florida. Everybody lands out there, right? Where are you at in Florida? Uh, Cocoa Beach, basically. Cocoa Beach? Yeah, Florida's nice. You yeah. Know? I mean, once you get used to the humidity and stuff, it's great. Yeah. And we yeah. live in a very quiet part. You know, it's not like, uh, it's not like jungle or stuff like that. It's, we live on the water. Yeah. It's quiet. You watch any comedy at all? I'm a comedian now. Um, Are you a comedy guy? I like Jack Black. Jack Black? Yeah. Yeah, he's some funny. Of, yeah, some of the, some of his stuff, but we don't tend to watch that much TV, really. Yeah. Apart from, like, stuff like Deadwood. Oh, yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, that stuff. Some good old TV. Like, you watch The Wire. Did you ever get into The um, Wire? I've been told that's really good. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Did you get into, like, Sopranos and Breaking Bad and all that stuff, or...? Not yeah, we got Game of Thrones, of oh, yeah. course. You know, cool, yeah. um, latest one was like say was Deadwood. Um, what others? Yeah, we watched Star Trek nonstop. Oh, Star Trek, yeah, the, I, the original, the sixties? No, the second generation. Oh, stuff. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because really, what we do is we just put it on as background noise. Yeah, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's sci-fi, right? So uh, the, uh, some of our music is sci-fi. So yeah, oh, definitely. Perfectly. What are you up to these days? I know we're out here in Vegas, and you did a uh, a one off here in Vegas. Uh, do you just you go out and just do one offs all summer? What are you up to? Um, I got the Lost Eighties tour uh, this summer. We got a tour of England, tour of Australia, a bunch of one offs. Uh, I'm probably gonna try and make another solo album or Seagulls album. Yeah, but. There's, other, there's uh, certain things in the works that may or may not come about. You know oh, yeah? I mean? So, yeah. Uh, there's some discussion on stuff, um, a little bit maybe with the originals, like we did the orchestral In 18? Album. Yeah, yeah. The um, orchestra, yeah. But I don't know if it would ever turn into playing live. Yeah. But, you know, there may be a little bit of... Uh, I have nice studios in both you know florida and in england so there may be a get together and record a couple of songs uh some solo stuff um and some with the the guys i use now as the seagulls yeah you know which i to tell you the truth prefer the band now than the original <laughs> is that right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well yeah no headaches right yeah no headaches at yeah all. so um, you show up here's the set list let's yeah. have fun everybody's like all right and they're glad to do it whereas, yeah you know like i say we said before in the end the original guys it turned into egos and uh, yeah and w when we did a reunion which was like 10 years ago was whatever, that the vh1 thing yeah what was that like um because there was some friction there right yeah it, it really i didn't want to do it I was already past it, and then I I thought, you know, I better do it now because if I don't, it might the chance might never come up again, and 
you got to take some of these chances when they're in your face. So I did it, immediately regretted it, saying I'd do it. Um, the same things that happened to the band originally to break us up, really. They, instead of taking three years, they took three weeks. Oh, man, same just things. right back there, the same stuff. Yeah, it, it, and to me, it was just like, God, I wish I'd never looked back. You know, <laughs> I've always had this thing, and it says, don't look back. Yeah. always look forward but I looked back and went yeah okay I'll do it and I was like now I'm like don't ever look back <laughs> but you know things uh, it's been a long time and in a way you know th I'm, we're still friends the original guys but is that right you're still friends yeah. just can't work together kind of yeah but maybe a little bit yeah you know? <laughs> <laughs> not like intense right you know? yeah yeah not intense, like a but, few days here and there and yeah, it's come not over that this bad. afternoon and play a bit of bass or some guitar or yeah you know, something like that yeah um not like man we've got to get this done it's, and then the other thing obviously is like uh how are you going to top what you did 30 years ago yeah you know yeah i mean that stuff is uh so iconic yeah. those first two records are just they're, they're just smoking. It's funny that people probably look at you for maybe two, three songs. But when you look at, and listen to these records, I was talking to my buddy Fletch yesterday. He's like, that first record, he's like, I listened to that thing for years on end, nonstop. Yeah. And uh, the, the deep tracks are just phenomenal on both the records. Both the records, you know, and the sound, it really takes you right back to like, wow, these sound amazing too. There's no, it's not really uh, dated in any way. It just really lets you know this is, this is some. Should we just put it out again? I, I think so. <laughs> I think so. You know, on vinyl, is it on vinyl? I have no idea. I don't look at it. Well, vinyl is the so new, hot. The so. new format, right? Yeah, it's the new, it's the new old. <laughs> but, I mean, do you have any vinyl? Are you a vinyl guy? No. I'm about to get out of my vinyl, I think. You know, I'm not even really a music guy. I like what I like. Yeah. Uh, but I don't go around collecting, uh, you know. I mean, I've probably bought the Beatles albums, every one of them, ten times. Yeah. Because... I have them, and then I forget about them, and then suddenly one day I'll go, where's my Abbey Road app? Oh, yeah. God, I'll have to buy it again, you know, to hear it, <laughs> yeah. and I'll listen to it for two days and lose it again. Are you a streamer now, or do you buy uh, uh, CDs, or what do you buy? Um, to stream? Yeah, I'll, but I'll buy it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do, too. Yeah, Absolutely. You know, I, I like to have it in the phone, so if I don't have signal, I can still listen to yeah, it. Yeah, I, I buy it because, of course, I don't want to be ripped off i don't want to rip anyone else off yeah. you know um I'm, I'm, i don't even go well i'm going to rip this off for a bit and then if i like it i'll buy it which i think a lot of people do yeah that's weird. i just go i like that i'm going to buy it yeah and even if i don't like it all fine it's worth you know, it's worth buying an album for eight bucks we like three songs on it, it really is keep that artist going because at some point he may do something spectacular and you know yeah, and, and you're going to buy a dumb cappuccino at Starbucks for like six ninety five. Right. What, right. you can't pay for music? $8? Exactly. Yeah. What are you, out of your mind? But I think the way uh, people think about music these days is, uh, it's, it's a terrible thing to say, I think, but it's disrespectful. Yeah. They just think they own it. Yeah. That's my music. Yeah. No, it's not. It's music that somebody wrote that you're lucky to get to listen to and enjoy. It's not your music. It's the artist's or the band's music. Yeah. You know, and, and give them their due. Give them a dollar. Yeah, I, I think that everyone, this is what I think would fix the music world, is if, say, in 10th grade in high school, it's mandatory that you have to learn an instrument and try to write a song. Some kind of art you have to do in school to where you learn oh, this just doesn't come easy. Right, yeah. uh, uh, it's the same if a guy was a welder or plumber. He wouldn't come to your house and you just go like, thanks, man, I'm not paying you. Yeah, It makes no sense to me. And yeah. I, I've talked about it a thousand times because I've had all kinds of great classic people on here. But yeah. uh, I think if people learn, had to learn something and they would just go like, oh, fuck, they would yeah. respect it more. Yeah, but I think because... 
They don't see a musician working. You're right. They think musicians are rich. They think it's party. They're partying, and they don't need the money, so I'm just going to take this song and yeah. call it mine and give it to all my friends. Yeah. And the guy may have struggled for a year to write that album or that song, you know, and then they just throw it away, basically. Yeah. But this is, again, like we said before, where you have to be in it for yourself. Yeah. You know, I, when I write a song, I write it for my own emotions, you know, for me to release my emotions to myself. Yeah. Uh, and I don't really care whether people buy it or like it. Um, it'd be great if they did, but it's not the, the, uh, the issue. Really. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing the show, man. Oh, it's been uh, great. great it was it was uh, really cool to talk to you, especially uh, somebody from my past. Uh, we're still standing up. Yeah, we're st we're still standing <laughs> up, and we were both at that festival that I still think is one of the most underrated festivals of all time. People talk about Woodstock over and over, but there's nothing really that blew open since Woodstock a complete world of yeah, uh, uh, ba acts and bands and music and stuff just like everything when you look at those those three days it's just like wow look at what was going on in the music world back then every band was great yeah and, and then uh, you know what you think that it was really just apple promoting themselves yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know isn't that weird that's the weirdest they didn't part care about they're the just out there little. pitching computers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little did they know they were going to ruin the music industry right. <laughs> <laughs> you got a uh, social media any kind Oh, uh, I don't really run it because, you know, I'm not really... I don't like to waste too much time on the internet. Yeah. I, when I'm on the internet, I go, I could be writing a song. Yeah. I could be messing around in my studio. So I can, I'll can. i get on the internet for a little bit. Apart from, like, you know, I get on Facebook and scroll around and see what people are saying and then, like, jump in now and again and go, ah, you're wrong, you silly bastard. Yeah. You know, and yeah. all this. And uh, <laughs> um, swear at a few people and stuff. And then I'll just go back and go, yeah, what a waste of time. Same same with video games, you know. Oh, I don't fuck with those. Those are like drugs. Yeah. You just get on them, and the next thing you know, four days gone by. <laughs> that is lunacy. I already know what that's going to do, because I when I was young. Halo. Yeah, oh, there you go, Halo. Halo yeah. Oh, my buddy was hooked on that. He'd bring the machine on the road with him. Uh -huh. ah, my Halo, you know. I think I spent three days sleeping on a sofa and playing halo you know until i got to the end of it yeah and then i was like wow i don't want to do that again <laughs> i know right you got to the end and you had no song <laughs> yeah. just, just halo in your head yeah and all the little creatures running around and stuff but yeah i think you know you go through phases and that's great but yeah songwriting is a I like. I always think then my next song is going to be the best one. Yeah, yeah. Wrote. Well, that's the right way to think. Uh, you know, I'm the same way with jokes, uh -huh. writing jokes constantly, hoping that I hit some gold. Yeah. And you got to uh, you got to be out in the river mining through yeah. sifting through sand to find that gold. Yeah, we say if you want to feel the breeze, go stand where it's windy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It was great to have you on the show. Cheers, man. And, nice to talk to you. And uh, thank you so much. And go see what what's the tour this summer? The Lost 80s Live, it's called. And, and is it all across America? Uh, yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think it's like 26 shows. Who's on that? Um, when in Rome. Uh, Wang Chung on that again this year. Uh, Generation um, Trans X You know To tell you the truth Yeah I'm really interested In what I'm doing on it Yeah 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 <laughs> I got you yeah, yeah 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 Alright Well thanks so, a lot But it was man. a lot of fun To do it last year So it'll be good this year That's great so. And uh, what an honor To talk to you It was just really wild To uh, meet you and, and have you on the show here So fantastic Thanks right. everybody For tuning in To another episode Of Let To Be Talked Don't forget to subscribe On uh, iTunes And YouTube And leave a review We're at 1500 reviews now We're trying to get to 2000 Thank you Keep the candles lit And get out there And listen to uh, A Flock of Seagulls uh, Their records are all On iTunes And it's some fantastic stuff See you guys <laughs>